So the next uh, presentation has to do with uh, something that, as you see in the first page, looks very rich as a map of the nominal extended projection. In fact, as we will see in the end, there are many more things that have to find some place within this fragment. And uh, so I will try to run through some of the evidence within certain uh, assumptions that maybe are not shared by everybody. But uh, again, don't think of the structure as being linearized in a certain way, because this is uh, uh, represents the scope positions of these elements as they are reconstructed from the word orders in head final and head initial languages that have to be undone, so to speak, to be able to see what the scope relations are. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, you remember that for phrases, uh, head final languages give a better, uh, or show in a better way what the relative position of elements is, that's the only order that you find. Whereas in languages that have the modifiers and complements and to the right of the verb or the noun, uh, since they come in, or they may come in different orders, you don't exactly see what the relative position is. And uh, uh, but, but that's uh, the, 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 the whole question of uh, reconstructing uh, this kind of uh, general order. So uh, I haven't talked about, you see that uh, about there, uh, I haven't talked about non-restrictive relative clauses, which actually seem to come in two different constructions. Uh, an integrated one, that's the only type that head final languages have, and looks like restrictive uh, in, in their syntax. Um, and it has a certain um, I, I, I just say that, but uh, it's not very really important. Uh, the integrated uh, non-restrictive, which is very high, we will see some examples later. Um, by non-restrictive, I mean the fact that it is within the extended projection of the noun phrase. And as a consequence of that, it has a number of restrictions. So for example, it cannot modify anything other than a DP. So uh, we know that in English, a non-restrictive relative clause can modify not only DPs, but APs, BPs, CPs. So you can say, that John was not here, which I find disgusting, where the which takes up the whole clause the CP which preceded, or the fact that Mary is tall, which I find nice, which there um, resumes tall, the AP. Now, this kind of relativization is impossible in head final languages. And the reason is that there, for, to be able to, to have such a discourse type of uh, non-restrictive, you need to have relative pronouns of a special kind, uh, which some languages have, like uh, Italian, Russian, French, uh, but not all languages have. And they can resume things that are not only DPs. Uh, so so uh, here is the, uh, the, the, the integrated type, which I put on top, and it is apparently above demonstratives and uh, universal quantifiers. So in the case of uh, uh, the order of uh, one type of universal quantifier, um, 
the non-distributive one, uh, you see, for example, cases in uh, uh, 2A and 2B from uh, one from Greek and one from Dakota, where you have in the mirror or mirror image order, uh, the sequence, universal quantifier, demonstrative, and even determiner. In many languages, a determiner cannot co-occur with uh, a demonstrative. For example, in Italian, you cannot say this the, or English, this the boy. Uh, <clears throat> but we know that many, in many cases, there are silent elements. For example, in Italian, we cannot say this one book. We can only say this book. Why can't we say this one book? Because you say these two books, these three books, and it's uh, funny that we cannot use the numeral of one. Of course, I mean, it's uh, related to the fact that in this case, this book is singular, one is singular, maybe it's redundant. But English allows one, so you can say this one book under a certain interpretation, you can say it. But certain languages don't allow you. Also, in Italian, we can say we will see each other at the feminine plural one, which only makes sense if you think that there are silent hours. So it means we will see each other at the plural feminine, ours silent, <coughs> and then one hour. So there are many silent elements. That, uh, uh, <coughs> so uh, Greek and Lakota really, and, and I give other cases of the co-occurrence of uh, demonstrative and <coughs> determiner in three, uh, but Greek and Lakota, the two uh, orders give you the sequence universal quantified the most of uh, <coughs> There are, however, languages that make, um, uh, that, that uh, show the presence <coughs> of another distributive type of quantifier that is lower. That's every. So all is actually ambiguous between uh, non-distributive and distributive. So when you say <clears throat> all the boys lifted the piano, there are two interpretations. It can be that each singular boy lifted the piano or that all of them together lifted the piano. Only the first one is distributive and the other is not. But every has to be distributed. Every boy lifted the piano, cannot be they all together lifted the piano. <clears throat> and every in English, one can see, occupies a position which is different from the position of all. Because in English, all has to precede a determiner. So you say all the boys. You cannot say the all boys. The all boys, that's impossible. But you cannot say every the boy, but you can say the, well, uh, every the whim uh, or desire, but you have to say the every whim or the every desire uh, or his every desire. Uh, <clears throat> so clearly the determiner discriminates between the position of all and the position of every. Uh, there is a restriction on every in the sense that it's in English it's possible to use it with uh, open sets. So you can say, I want to know the every whim of Mrs. Thatcher, whatever. but you cannot say, I want to know the every uncle of John. <coughs> so if you have a, a closed set, that does not seem to be. So uh, this is reported in six. Uh, I want to meet all your aunts, but you cannot say, I want to meet your every aunt. But you can say, I, I want to know, or they watch his every step. Whatever. Now, finite relative clauses, I was saying that uh, seem if they are restrictive, 
they seem to be to occur between the demonstrative and the cardinal numerals. And <clears throat> this is true for many, I mean, you can see that clearly, more clearly in head, in, in head final languages, which don't reverse the order of the modifiers. In head initial languages, where the relative clause is final, you don't see where it came from. So you have, for example, in English, at least in this mixed type of languages, like English or Italian, you, see, you have these three books that I bought. And that I bought, if it's not, it cannot be generated to the right of the noun, and has originated uh, in, on the left branch in between demonstrative and numeral, has ended up at the end. And you don't know where it came from. You can know, though, for those well-behaved and initial languages, which have all the modifiers following, and then you have a mirror image. So you find such languages. Let me see if I have some. Yeah, in uh, eight, uh, A double prime, uh, you have a number of languages that show, of a head initial type, that show the position of the restrictive relative clause after the noun, in between the numeral cardinal, typically, and the demonstrative or determinant. But in uh, these mixed languages, uh, SVO, you don't really see. Um, the following uh, sentences uh, in 9 through 12 simply show what I had said earlier, that the position of more restrictives is higher up than the position of restrictives. Uh, and this, again, you can see uh, in some languages, but you don't see it uh, in other languages. For example, in Italian, uh, both of them are to the right of the noun. Uh, you have a hint of their relative order, because if you have both the restrictive relative clause and the non-restrictive relative clause, the non-restrictive follows the restrictive. And to the right, that means that it's higher up, although that has to be shown. Uh, but in many languages, uh, it's actually clear. So in, uh, in 9a, in Korean, if it, it, if it appears between the demonstrative and the noun, it's interpreted as a restrictive. If it appears before the determiner, before the determiner or the, mon the, the demonstrative, actually, is not it's uh, 9b, it is interpreted as non-restrictive. Exactly the same thing is in Vietnamese, 10a, where it uh, precedes the uh, Vietnamese, the modifiers are uh, follow the, the noun, and the restrictive precedes the demonstrative, although here I don't have an example with a cardinal to show that it's exactly in between them that it appears. But in 10b, when it follows, it is interpreted as non-restrictive. Uh, in Indonesian, that's again, uh, here, Yura, we say something about, uh, I took it from somewhere, so I don't remember where, but uh, it's uh, probably the uh, name, I mean. So if it's uh, preceding the demonstrative, it's restrictive. If it, if it follows the demonstrative, it's interpreted as non-restrictive. And the same is true for Louisiana Creole. So it really appears that the two occupy very different positions. Which makes sense if you think that non-restrictives modify something which is already independently identified, a proper name or a pronoun or a, the book which is clear independently of the relative clause. So uh, uh, it means that the relative clause modifies something that already has a demonstrative and determiner that uh, indicates its reference. Uh, <clears throat> well, yeah, uh, there are also languages that uh, have two positions for 
restrictives that not only can they appear between the demonstratives and the numeral, but they can also appear before the demonstrative. And that's true for Chinese, for a number of other languages, for Japanese. Uh, <clears throat> but there, I would take that they have been moved from the position where they were inserted, namely in between the demonstrative and the numeral, to the front for some particular reason. What is interesting, I mean, because semantically, they have to be under the scope of the demonstrative anyway. So, it means that they have to be inserted down there. If they appear before the demonstrative, they don't have necessarily a non-restrictive interpretation. They still have a restrictive one. So it means that they are moved there for independent reasons. And interestingly, in Japanese, they move to a position which is lower than the position of page generation of uh, non-restrictives. So it's a different position altogether. Um, well, ordinal and, uh, and cardinal, this should uh, require a much more detailed analysis because, in fact, you can have both orders which actually should not be taken to suggest that ordinals are freely ordered with respect to cardinals, but that there are probably two positions with two separate interpretations, and you can combine them. You can say in various languages something like uh, the first two, uh, last, I'm sorry, the, um, the last two first days of school. And you can interpret it. So if the first days of school are, let's say, five days, and you want to say the last two first days of school, apparently it's possible in uh, Russian as well, it's given by Pelitzvai Kagan and Pelitzvai as an example. Anyway, I, I don't have it here, but, and this is true in Italian, it's true in French. And, uh, so, but otherwise, typically, there is one order in which the ordinal precedes the, the cardinal, and in some cases, I suppose, uh, in 14a and b, uh, show the order in a very strict uh, way. Uh, the numeral classifiers. Now here, uh, 18, no, numeral classifiers generally follow the numeral. Uh, now, the, uh, traditionally, uh, people say there are numeral classifier languages and no numeral classifier languages, so that in English you don't say uh, three units books or three piece or three leaves books, whereas in some languages you have to say something like that. Uh, however, uh, I think one can push the idea that all languages are numeral classifier languages. They only differ in the number of classifiers that they have. And Greenberg already had noticed, for example, that there are languages like Bulgarian, which have like two, or at most three, classifiers. Um, and uh, there are languages that have hundreds of classifiers. Um, now, the question is whether languages like Italian or English, uh, which are said not to have any classifier, can be shown to have some classifiers, and I think it, they can be. Uh, I'll come back immediately to that. But for example, in, um, uh, in Bulgarian, apparently there, is, uh, there are two classifiers, and maybe a third one used for animals, glava, glava. Uh, but you can use chovek, person, and you can use dushi, plural. So you can say, uh, so instead of saying edin actor, one actor, you can say one person actor. And uh, if you have a, a, a human, plural, uh, masculine 
of a certain class of nouns, uh, you can use dushi. So you can say trima dushi novi studenti. That's in uh, footnote six. In fact, it's interesting that here you have two classifiers. You have ma, which you don't find with chairs or with anything. I don't know if Russian, does Russian have anything like ma? With no. numerals? No. <laughs> with uh, masculine, plural? No. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and then you have dushi, which is optional. I mean, ma is obligatory and dushi is optional. And exactly the same uh, type of numeral classifier followed by sort of classifier is found, for example, in Akatek Maya, that you find in uh, two, same footnote, because you have two classifier, then numeral classifier for round objects, in Bulgarian it's for human masculine objects, then you have an adjective, then you have another classifier, which is a nominal classifier, and then you have the noun. To say two tortillas, you have a lot of things. Uh, <coughs> now, uh, I think there is one uh, indirect way of telling the presence of classifiers even in Italian and English, if you consider one, um, I mean two, uh, two, 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 uh, two facts. Uh, one fact is the fact that in so-called obligatory numeral classifier languages, there are some nouns that have no classifier. So this is the first surprising fact, so to speak was noticed already by Greenberg, who already understood something, which was later developed by others, that those particular cases of apparent nouns that did not have a classifier uh, were actually classifiers, not nouns. And that's why they did not have a noun. Now, this cannot be seen when the order is um, uh, for example, in uh, say in Chinese, when they are contiguous, uh, <coughs> uh, because uh, they are adjacent, and if one is missing, you don't know whether it's a, uh, sorry. If they are adjacent, you don't know whether one is missing or the other is missing. But in some languages, in particular Thai, let me check, uh, where the order is uh, <coughs> now numeral classifier, they are not adjacent. So you can tell, depending on where you find the noun, whether it's a real noun or a classifier. And uh, you should look at the 19. So that's the normal case of noun numeral classifier. Four dogs, you say four, uh, dog for body. However, you say with uh, uh, year, day, and other measure nouns, you don't have a classifier. But interestingly, the position of the noun is not before the numeral, but is after the numeral. So it's, you don't say year one, but you say one year. So year occupies the position of the classifier. So that's the first uh, fact. The second fact uh, <coughs> comes from an observation by Cheng and Sibesma about Chinese, that uh, classifiers, except for two adjectives that give a special interpretation cannot be um, cannot be uh, modified by an adjective. So now we have a way to check whether Italian and English uh, treat year, day, and such nouns that are really classifiers as classifiers. We have to check whether they can be modified by an adjective or not. 
and it so appears that there is a difference. If you use year or day in argument position, like in an object position, then you, they can be modified. But if you use them as measure nouns, as measure, uh, then they cannot be modified. And this is shown in 21A and B. Uh, <clears throat> so you can say he spent three long or three uh, tremendous years in prison, fine, but you cannot say the building will be ready in less than three tremendous years or three long years or three whatever. And there is even one, so at least we can say that in Italian and in English, and apparently in Bulgarian is the same, um, that certain nouns like year, day, according to their usage, are either proper nouns when they occur in argument position, or they are classifiers. And we know that from obligatory classifier languages <coughs> that there are so-called repeaters, so that there are some classifiers that look exactly like the noun. So you say three room room, you say three rooms. Uh, and volta time seems to be only a classifier because you can never, uh, uh, even with when volta occurs, I, I forgot to put in 20 to be volte, I skipped volte, but you should add volte, uh, it's completely possible. So he spent two nice times in that city, or two beautiful times in that city. Even though it is in an argument position, you cannot modify it. Uh, the only modification that you can have are very high adjectives, like the next time, uh, the, uh, the usual time that can appear free numeral. And that's fine because both is down uh, below the numeral, so it's not uh, a problem. Uh, so I think one can uh, try to say that uh, all languages are alike in that respect, that they all are classifier languages. It only depends on how many classifiers they have. Uh, <coughs> Participial reducer and clauses is next. They seem to follow cardinals and I don't know about classifiers, it depends on. I don't actually have uh, arguments. Well, no, it, um, Chinese may, be, may offer one such. Uh, I'll come back. <coughs> so, there are some uh, languages that seem to have a, a relative clause lower down. Remember that I said that uh, restrictive relative clauses are overwhelmingly between demonstrative and numeral, but if you take this North Caucasian, I hope it's North Caucasian, Kavanta language, uh, <coughs> the relative clause seems to be lower than the numeral. But then you see that the relative clause is really is a participial clause, which differently from other languages can have even a subject of its own, uh, relativizing uh, the object. Um, and this seems to go together with uh, an observation that Rakoff had that in Dutch and German and other uh, Germanic languages, um, participial relative clauses are below numerals and above at least one type of adjectives that we saw, the direct modification adjectives. And you find the examples in 26. Uh, 27, so these are dry here before I bite it. If you have the numeral following, you have to give a special interpretation of three men which make up uh, some kind of uh, team or something, not the, the usual uh, way. Uh, <clears throat> and the uh, reduced anti clause 27b cannot appear below. Uh, an adjective of the direct modification type. Uh, Bulgarian seems to be uh, the same. 
and even English, because uh, you can say 29A, I finally met the two recently appointed professors, but not, at least easily, I finally met the recently appointed two professors. Now, Chinese uh, shows typically the position of relatives below numerals, as well as above demonstratives, but not between, not easily between demonstrative and numerals, which makes one believe that these are really reduced relative clauses. They are not full finite. In fact, uh, it's not clear that Chinese has finite verbs, anyway. I mean, finite uh, overt verbs. Um, <coughs> So, uh, if that's true, then uh, Chinese would show that reduced relative clauses not only follow numerals, but also classifiers that go with the numeral, as shown in 30, uh, so that you can come up to the order in 31 uh, with, the, with the reduced relative clause following the classifier, not only the numeral. Uh, the next uh, is number words, which seem to be below classifiers, although I don't know about uh, their relation with reduced early clauses, so that remains to be seen. Um, Sometimes it is claimed that uh, number is incompatible with classifiers, but that does not seem to be the case. Because there are many languages that have both classifiers and plural um, morphemes. So, uh, then the, the attributive adjectives that we have seen yesterday, so I won't go over them. Uh, here is a list of, of order of a number of uh, classifiers given in Scott, 2002, uh, where you see that he came up with a certain ordering, very fine grain ordering, with the subjective component, uh, preceding habitation, adjective size, length, height, height speed, depth, we've <laughs> seen a lot of them. Anyway, uh, <coughs> then let me devote some time to uh, something very minute, but uh, there might be some mission with Russian. Uh, the position of diminutives, endearing elements, augmentatives, and pejoratives. Uh, now, uh, English seems to give evidence of a certain type that Italian does not give. <coughs> But Italian gives evidence of another type that English does not give. So putting together the two, we can come to certain conclusions that have to be checked with other languages, of course. But so the first uh, um, thing to say is that uh, in English, you don't, I mean, English is taken not to have a typical uh, diminutive or augmentatives, uh, in the sense that there are no suffixes which are a typical, I mean, diminutives seem to be universal, uh, as uh, argued by a number of people, and they take the most diverse form. They can be a suffix, they can be a prefix, they can be a reduplication, they can change the consonant or the vowel, they can belong to a different class, uh, gender class or so, uh, and they can be expressed by uh, adjectives. Uh, adjectives that take a special form. So uh, if you look at English now, in 34, uh, an adjective like little, if it is stressed, uh, is equivalent to small. So it's a normal adjective. So you can say, I can't stand little cars, or we men little in stature, and so on. However, there is a usage of little, which is unstressed, 
and which sometimes it's written little, lil, li, apostrophe l, little, uh, which also has a different uh, interpretation. You can have uh, either a diminutive or an endearing interpretation, as you see in 35a, where in, if you say, that's quite a little discovery that you made there, uh, it's very different from that's quite a small discovery that you made there. The first is not impolite. The second is very impolite. Because you are saying that uh, the discovery that you made is very significant. But the first one is like uh, endearing. Also, uh, when <coughs> it's unstressed, uh, it cannot be predicative, so you cannot say that mistake is little. You can only, only say that mistake is small. Another uh, endearing kind of adjective is we. So you cannot say this dog is we, although you can say this little we dog in English, uh, but you cannot use it predicative. Now, English, uh, English seems to show these were facts given to me by Kane and other, other people uh, that <coughs> seems to show where this little uh, of the, at least of the endearing type, but I guess also the diminutive type, uh, comes below value adjective. So if you remember the fragment, uh, I don't know if I gave the fragment, but smaller than the one given by skull, so you have value or as if the diminutive of hearing little uh, has to follow the value adjective. So look at the contrast in 37A and B. That's quite a nice little discovery that you made there, which is acceptable to these people, but not, that's quite a little nice discovery that you've made there, where little precedes the value adjective. In 38AB, although here you have to give a special interpretation, seems to show that little uh, has to, uh, pre um, to follow also um, size adjectives uh, <coughs> and cannot uh, precede them. So that's a really big little discovery that you made there, where little is the endearing uh, but it cannot precede the size. Although it uh, precedes now all the lower adjectives. So 39A and B show that you, my little round baby face, now these are special ways of uh, testing, but not you, my round little baby face. So little has to precede shape. So it has to come between here, between size and, uh, and, and shape. And uh, a fortiori, it has also to uh, precede color. Uh, you see that in 40 AB, you my little white guinea pig, and not you my white little guinea pig. Uh, and also my little Chinese doll in front of the nationality adjective, but not my Chinese little doll. So uh, 
that, I mean, English seems to show that they, they seem to take a particular position. Uh, now, uh, Italian does not show that, and possibly Russian does not show that. Although in Italian we do have some usage of an adjective. We, we have a lot of um, suffixes, uh, it's like Russian. Uh, but we also can use, um, there is a famous song uh, that uh, uh, contains the word, uh, questo piccolo grande amore, this small, this little big love, where you have obviously the little uh, uh, seems to be, um, uh, anyway, uh, it's uh, I mean, a combination of two apparently uh, contradictory cases that can be made sense if one of the adjectives have a diminutive or augmentative uh, meaning. Uh, but interestingly, Italian offers uh, the, sh the ordering of uh, these elements between or among each other. So, I, I, as I will try to show you now, that uh, when they can co-occur, the suffix for augmentative is higher than the suffix for pejorative, which is higher than the suffix for diminutive, which is higher than the suffix for endearing. And I also found that in Russian, apparently, we have similar things with diminutive and endearing, but I'll come back to uh, <clears throat> Now remember now that uh, to be able to say that uh, that the um, that a certain suffix is higher than some other suffix, when it follows that other suffix, uh, you have to imagine a certain derivation of. And remember what we saw, which I repeated here in 43 and 44, when you uh, have uh, future, for example, in, in English, that is higher than perfect and higher than progressive, and English only moves the lexical verb uh, incorporating to the uh, progressive suffix, uh, but the rest of the suffixes is borne by auxiliaries. So in English you see the order which is typical um, of head initial languages with future being higher than perfect aspect, which is higher than progressive aspect. In, uh, this Tibeto-Burman language in 44, uh, all of these follow in the mirror image, which again can be interpreted as uh, derived from the same structure as English with uh, the verb incorporating to first to the lowest uh, progressive, then together incorporating to the middle perfect, and then the whole thing incorporates into uh, tense, future as in 44a. So with this in mind, if we look at now Italian, the suffixes of Italian, we can get an idea which one of the two is higher uh, under the mirror principle, under the fact that what follows to the right is higher than what precedes in the typical case. Now, so in Italian we have lots of uh, uh, suffixes for diminution and especially for um, endearment. And, but the most typical ones are ino, ina, in for uh, diminution and et, etto, etta for endearment. And you can see that because uh, when you uh, want to say to play house, when the children play house, but uh, uh, we say to play mother house, little house. So if they are playing as having a little house, and we use casetta, we don't use casina, which only means small house. Um, or if you say, uh, I miss my dear home, uh, you say, mi manca la mia casetta. You don't say, I miss la mia casina. That's impossible. So, 
anything endearing is ficta, and eno is real diminutive. Now, with this in mind, then, if you look at the number of cases 45, uh, if you combine uh, WOMO, uh, here now the, the, the stress changes the diphthong to non-diphthong, so you have ometo or mino, both are possible with uh, WOMO, and if you combine them, they can only, you can only combine them in one way. So you can say ometino, but not omineto, and the same with librettino, little book, casettina, facettina, and so on. In the pejorative and augmentative suff suffixes, this is one augmentative and accio is a, a pejorative. And again, with one we say no macho, the ugly man, un omone is a big man. You can say un omacione, a big ugly man, but you cannot say un omonaccio, completely impossible. And the same with the no, 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 macho, and so on. You, you, you find them in 46. Now, it seems difficult to combine both augmentative, pejorative, diminutive, or theory because they seem to, to, to signify contradictory things. But uh, it's actually possible, and they, if you do, you come up with uh, the following order, which uh, I gave earlier. Um, So here is a So the suffixes are one, ach, acho, ino, and eto. And uh, in effect, uh, you can see uh, they, they should, I mean, if you have the uh, noun here, and if what I said, what happens in the construction of suffixes, is that the noun phrase raises first to the lowest and then to the higher ones, the only order that you get is noun, eto, and then you move this, and then you get ino. So you get noun, eto, ino. That is casettina, not casinetta, or librettina, and not the, the opposite. But you can also combine Eto, skipping ino and moving it up here. And you can also combine eto with one, skipping the others. And some examples are given. Uh, uh, 50, uh, 52, sorry, 51 gives the combination of eto with acho. And you get a strange uh, meaning uh, of uh, affection, but also of uh, irony. When you say, zia touch, I didn't put glosses. That means my ugly dear uncle, roughly. And it's an ironic way of uh, showing endearment by using also a bad uh, And uh, you can also combine eto with one directly and uh, pezzettone, uh, which means, uh, for example, you can, this I took from a uh, uh, description of diminutives in Italian, where uh, it's, uh, again, it's somewhat ironic. You are saying, I want, uh, a little piece, but must be big, something like that. So it's, uh, it's that kind. But what's interesting is that you cannot have the other order. So you cannot have pezzonetto, you cannot have uh, 
Zia Cetto, as you see in 51 above, and in 52. Uh, then you can also expect to combine Ino with Accio, forgetting about Eto, and Ino with One. Uh, and this also you find. So it's um, 53 in Accio, as opposed to Omacino, which is impossible. And then, uh, and then the diminutive Ino with One, and that's uh, un ominone uh, and not omonino. These are very clear um, judgments for many speakers of Italian. Um, now, that uh, raises one question that, that uh, why should uh, these come in such an order? I mean, there is no clear semantic, uh, obvious at least, semantic scope relation. Well, one might say, well, you know, mentatives, I, I don't see. Anyway, this remains uh, uh, to more or less finish and leave uh, uh, Germans and possibly Russian seems to show, at least for the diminutive and theory, I don't know about the augmentative, uh, uh, seem to show some, something similar. So German, if you look at 50, uh, it should be 56, but it's uh, for some reason 50. Uh, <coughs> so you can say Oma, grandmother, 50B. Oma line, at least in the northern varieties of German, because in the southern varieties, you don't have Oma Ken, you only have Oma line, so it's only one is possible. And but here too you have only one possible combination. So you can say Oma Lineshen and not Oma Shen line. That's impossible. And my uh, consultant said that uh, of the two, line, those that have both line and chen, line is the uh, endearing and chen is the pure diminutive. And although I don't have the examples from an article by Boe Ikova, uh, she says, uh, usually if there are two degrees of diminutivization in Russian, the second diminutive takes the semantic meaning of smallest, smallness, whereas the first one is used only for expressive nuances. And uh, I don't know, with, uh, I think, Malchi, she had an example with Malchi, uh, 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 with two diminutive, uh, you should be able to construct, I guess, one with two diminutive. Yes. It's not one that needs to concentrate, I don't know. Anyway, that's true, again, this seems to be a case like Italian. In the case you have etto, which is the expressive nuance, effective, and the pure diminutive, which comes after. Actually, Bulgarian shows the opposite order, which uh, has to be explained by skipping and not doing the, but anyway. So let me just finish here, because it's coming late, and, uh, to say that uh, we have a lot of things within the, and uh, a lot of things are still missing because you have to find place for case, which seems to be very high, or probably the highest. Then you have associative number, which also is very high, above demonstratives. Uh, then you have uh, demonstrative reinforces, these here guys in English also leave C in French. Then you have um, several quantifiers which presumably occupy different positions. Uh, some, several, most, the many, few. Then you have pre numeral functional adjectives like other, same, previous, next, usual. They can combine. So the, the. Then you have pre numeral superlative, hence, approximate numerals, uh, like five-ish, and I think in Russian you have a special inversion for approximative numerals, right? So that seems to show that it's slightly above 
the numerals and you have to move something in that position to make it approximate. In some languages, the approximate uh, morpheme is higher than the numeral, and so that makes it. Then you have numeral classifiers of various types, mensural classifiers, I mean, and, and many other things. <laughs> so <laughs> there is a lot to discover yet. Okay, I'll finish here, and thank you for being so patient to <coughs> listen to uh, sometimes a little heavy kind of stuff that I presented, but Thank you very much. But I think that he should still have uh, many questions. <laughs> no. Uh, is there, uh, is there uh, such a, uh, uh, such a way to extend this reconstruction, or uh, is it even needed? Uh, uh, to have uh, more cases and some of them uh, considered higher and some lower because well uh, in some languages uh, we have uh, case stacking which is not explained uh, via ellipsis. Right. Well, you know, if you are familiar with uh, uh, Blake's, uh, but especially there is a dissertation which was uh, written in uh, Tromsø, Norway, by a Czech student. And he has uh, uh, a hierarchy of cases with uh, uh, the nominative being the lowest and the others piled up with the uh, accusative coming next, then uh, genitive, then dative, and then uh, other like instrumental, uh, locative, and so on. And the, the interesting thing is that each of the higher ones contains the lower. And he achieves a number of uh, I mean, syncretism, certain cases of syncretism which are possible and others are not possible. For example, only uh, contiguous cases syncretize. And, uh, and then the question uh, comes up of where prepositions that often come with cases are also located. And it seems that, again, languages differ there but systematically, in the sense that, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, for example, um, if you take English or Italian, uh, we don't have cases uh, about nominative and accusative, let's say, but accusative is probably non-nominative or something. And then we start having prepositions with something. And the preposition takes uh, the, uh, I mean, the prepositions come with genitive, dative, locative, and so on. And the case that is overt on the noun is the one immediately below. So it's accusative. So ame, dime, and so on. If you go a little bit above, namely you have a case like a genitive or a dative, then if you use a preposition which is higher up, locative or instrumental, then it can select uh, this lower, but not skipping too much. I think there are some restrictions of what you can do. So it's very interesting the way he manages to bring in a lot of languages. And it's downloadable. It's, uh, it's called, uh, uh, I don't remember the title. Uh, the nanosyntax of case. Final ah, the Saha. nanogram. Okay, yeah, sure. The nanosyntax, Saha. The nanosyntax of case. Mm -hmm.
now now is separated by, by the Jurassic Park. So I don't know whether it was better or not, but it's an old world. Well, there are differences in the order that I gave in 18. Eh? Depending on the language, you have the mirror image or not the mirror image. In Japanese, is particularly complex because it has three different ways of having noun, numeral, classifier, I think. Then he and derived the other way uh, from this structure as well. And yeah, I don't know which one, presumably the expected uh, ordinary one would be demonstrative, numeral, classifier, noun, uh, with case at the end, which is, uh, is that possible, according to you? Uh, I think it's one of the three, because yeah. they have three t different yeah. uh, orders. But uh, this one is derived together with the noun classifier, uh, uh, noun numeral classifier, there is one derivation for both of them. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know precisely what's going on. It's, well, it's, uh, yeah. I mean, it's just another option. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yes. Uh, here on this big tree of noun phrase, we have a. Uh, which, so which number? Uh, the, the first one. one or the yeah, last the one? one. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the big one. <laughs> Uh, we have uh, so many uh, modifiers, but only two heads. And uh, which uh, places do they have all these modifiers? Are they, are they in specs or...? Yeah, uh, I mean, all the phrases should be... I mean, all the complex phrases which are made up of more can be made up of more and more things, like uh, certainly uh, relative clauses are complex, uh, universal quantifiers are complex because you can say almost all, or uh, even Italian with uh, other modifiers. Demonstrative phrases are complex, at least under a certain analysis they contain a determiner plus a locative element. Uh, the determiner, at least, uh, seems to be ahead, although there are even, uh, uh, there is a, a more radical recent uh, proposal by Cain who uh, tries to claim that uh, uh, heads are always silent and everything overt has to be in specifier position. Although one has to make a distinction anyway because we saw that they behave differently in ideal languages, head final, head initial, Certain things go to the right, certain things end up to the left. So we have to make anyway some kind of distinction between among classif um, specifiers. Uh, but what you find is that typically uh, articles, number, uh, in fact the diminutive in a number of languages goes with articles and number. So it looks like it's a head, although it depends on the language probably. Yeah, but the, my question is, uh, um, where, uh, why do we have so many uh, sp specifiers and where are the heads of the specifiers? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> right. They are silent in the sense that uh, I mean, uh, there is also a, in, in, in one of the bare phrase structure within the genetic tradition, uh, you only have one, uh, it can be either head or specifier, you don't need to have, this is more uh, traditional in having an X-bar theory with a head and a specifier, but Chomsky has also proposed that uh, uh, it depends which, if, if something projects, then it's a head. If something does not project, something else projects instead, then it must be specified. But you don't need to have both head and specified. So it depends very much, it's a, it becomes a technical way to. Uh, I think, I mean, 
there is an empirical question, namely that languages seem to make a difference between certain elements, treating them as we saw in complementizers, mod I mean, modal verbs or instruction verbs more generally, auxiliaries, uh, tense particle or whatever, uh, at least some tense particles, they go on one side of the verb, the lexical verb. All of the adverbs, complements, and what are on the other side. So uh, it's inherently why one should ask why certain things are uh, treated, let's say, as heads. It's, it's It's almost true that, I mean, traditional heads, like complementizers, but, I mean, Kane has uh, argued against, because if uh, one complementizer like that, in English, for example, if it's the same morphine that you have in that book, it means that that, that has a silent noun that follows. So it would be complex, not a single thing. And he even goes to say that ED, past, is complex. So uh, that is going really very radically to... Uh, okay. <laughs> More questions? Oh. In fact, I have many questions, but, uh, but I think I'll be... Uh, uh, will be restrictive. So, in fact, I'll, so in fact, I'll restrict uh, uh, myself just to two <laughs> questions, um, one of which is somewhat provocative, actually, but um, let, let it be the, the last question. And, um, but, but here I have a simple, uh, here I have a simple question um, which concerns the participants. I wonder whether they should be whether they should be restrictive. Uh, restrictive, you mean? No. Um, uh, when you um, when you have reduced relative in some in some specified position, say after numerals and so on, right? Uh, uh, um, is it possible there uh, so uh, to have both? Restrictive and no restrictive. And no restrictive. I think so. Yeah. Although uh, I think there are some. Um, right. For example, there are some uh, works by Larson, uh, cited, cited, and uh, um, Chinese uh, linguists mm -hmm. uh, claiming that both in Chinese and in Japanese. And more clearly, Chinese, the risk of being reduced relative to being after them. There seems to be an ordering between uh, stage level and individual level interpretation. When you get two, then stage level is before individual level. It's a little bit like, although in a different domain, stage what level we saw before individual level. And that seems to go together, although they are in two different fields, what we saw about the adjectives, that stage level seems to precede individual level. Um, and maybe also the restrictive, no restrictive. I, I have looked at some cases, but Italian is not uh, entirely clear, if you say. First of all, we have to put them both to the right, but I mean, it's a mirror image. So let me try out to say. If uh, you say, you know, so the books admired by most people arrived yesterday, that's fine. 
Let me try the opposite. Il libro di Vatieri è mirato da tutti. In fact, it seems strange if you interpret Amirati da Tutti as being a quality of those books, whereas the right yesterday is really staged by both. The question now with restrictivity is less clear. It's less clear. But anyway, here you should have two notes for Yeah. <laughs> or, or, or <laughs> ten <laughs> notes or <laughs> dozen <laughs> notes. Okay. Um, so, um, so, 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 in fact, uh, my second question is that um, I wonder whether uh, we may we may observe any um, any effects like pipe piping and so on uh, uh, in the ethics of the main uh, for for ethics. Oh, yeah, we do. In the sense that I mean, this has been uh, argued for by Kopman the basis of a number of languages. But the fact that I said about uh, about Bulgarian. So in Bulgarian, apparently, the order uh, of diminutive and theory is the opposite. So I, I can't really something like uh, is brother, brother, uh, and then you can add. I'm not sure that it's spelled well, but so le is the endearing, and sir, say, is the. Uh, no, no, it's vice versa. Uh, this is the uh, diminutive. Uh, I don't want to say something. Um, yeah. uh, I think this is the endearing. And this is the pure divinity, which is the opposite of ten. Now, this might be, uh, might suggest that you skip here. If you have brat here, then you have uh, so. then you have day here and set here. You don't go like in Italian up here and then you take the whole thing and you move it up here. Mm -hmm which would give ratlets, but you skip. So you move either with the other type of pipe piping or with the no pipe piping. And uh, I mean, although the prevailing order of suffixes is the one where you apply the whose picture, so you get the mirror image. There are cases, uh, we saw also one yesterday, I think, where you don't have mirror image. And you have the direct order that you find pre-nominally. And so that seems to show that even morphology, and this is what uh, Kopman has really tried to show, that you have one, she says, only one engine that works for morphology and for syntax, and you can do it, yeah. Thank you very much. Of course, we do have this in Circassian in Adelaide. We know this. We don't need an image. Uh, or uh, we have just uh, by fighting for some, oh. uh, or some postposition of incorporation. Incorporation. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. So, So if I got correctly, uh, you uh, claim this order of projections as to be universal, or so. And I just I, I was just wondering whether it were it should also work 
if uh, these pejorative, augmentative, or diminutive projections are uh, con contain uh, quantifiers in their pejorative me meaning. So, for example, like uh, something like sum in pejorative meaning. Oh. Would it work for this? Because it, I'm not really sure, but I think that maybe uh, the order uh, will, will be more strict in this case, and all this stuff will go to the left. It's for Russian. It's yeah, so I mean, when you combine uh, a quantifier yes, with, with some. A, uh, with some pejorative meaning. But can you add the, the suffix to the quantifier? No, no, there is no, uh, or no. There is not about suffixes, but about something like in English. When you with this little in several, into, in ah. several meanings. Because in English, big also seems to have some augmentative. I don't know about ugly if they can use it for pejorative. Uh, I'm not sure I, I understand what, what you aim at, namely uh, if you can have a pejorative uh, interpretation of some uh, yeah. quantifier, let's say. Uh, I don't know whether, unless there is some morpheme that is recognizable. Uh, well, yes. There is a marker of the quantifier which could be so. For example, uh, these are not really quantifiers, but indefinite pronouns with, this, with some indefinite markers, which uh, could, uh, um. which are able to have uh, this pejorative interpretation. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, I don't know what you think in general. People here think about silent elements, because I think. And Kane again, has, uh, I think, provided a lot of evidence that uh, languages are full of uh, silent elements. So it could be that uh, you don't activate uh, overtly this particular position of pejorative that goes somehow is uh, connected with, uh, in some way you have to say that uh, it's correlated to a certain other thing, for example. So that if you have an indefinite quantifier and then you activate a lower pejorative position, then you get this impression that the quantifier is pejorative. Uh, that's highly theory internal in the sense that one could say, well, no, I don't think there are silent elements. Or, uh, a bigger question is, I mean, when you see all of these things, uh, what happens when you, when you say, I love books? What is there? because you don't see anything else but uh, the NP. And uh, in the sentence, I think one can, uh, as I was discussing with uh, Natasha, there is a sense in which you can, when I gave that long list of uh, aspects and uh, moods and tenses and so on, uh, when you say it rains, for instance, mm -hmm. you can say you know a lot of things, although you don't hear. So you know it's active, not passive, it's uh, non-negative, that uh, it is um, uh, non-evidential, uh, and many other things which are left implicit. And so you could say that these are un underspecified. Some of, uh, you know, per perfect aspect is underspecified, progressive is underspecified, and so on. So you have the entire sequence, but you pick only and you activate only those positions that are required for any of the others as irrelevant, as unspecified. And I mean, here it's less clear whether you have to leave unspecified demonstrative and uh, adjectives of different kinds and so on, but uh, I guess you could claim something like that. that uh, maybe, I mean, this is one way. Another way is to say you have this as a possibility, the entire sequence, and you simply choose segments of these which are compatible with the entire sequence uh, to your needs. And uh, that's another way of 
I don't know. It's not easy to decide which one. Okay. So thank you very much again. <laughs>